So the third speaker in our series is uh, transportation engineer Rick Hall. Uh, Rick's Tallahassee-based firm, Hall Planning and Engineering, works throughout the U.S. and he's actually collaborated on numerous projects with Victor and Andres. Uh, Rick holds a bachelor's and a master's degree from Virginia Tech, but we, we've decided not to hold that against him. <laughs> um, the Wahoo says that. <laughs> he is. Uh, he's. He worked out of school, I think, Rick, for the Florida Department of Transportation for about eight years before going into the private sector. Um, he was part of a team that authored a joint Institute for Transportation Engineers, Congress for the New Urbanism Street Design Manual, which is a revolutionary document. Uh, he served as visiting professor at FSU's Department of Urban and Regional Planning, where he taught land use and transportation courses. And he's also served as the president of the Florida section of the Institute of Transportation Engineers. I've had the pleasure of working with Rick on a number of projects throughout South Carolina. In addition to ION, his low country work includes an alternate plan for Johnny Dodds Boulevard out here, and he was the originator of the pitchfork concept that Jake Herbeck there knows about um, at the intersection of Maybank and River Road on Johns Island. So ladies and gentlemen, please uh, join me in, in giving Rick a warm low country welcome. This is a Virginia gentleman graduating from UVA, and it's always a pleasure <clears throat> to work with him and even take 15 or 20 minutes to discuss things with him. Um, he's, he's taking on a new challenge to go and, uh, and, and capture the state capitol and all of their uh, uh, procedures for doing transportation funding, and uh, so I wish him a lot of luck on that. Well, <clears throat> engineers are a different breed. Um, how many of you can remember the engineers that were a part of the American television sitcom experience? You know, you have plenty of architects and, and, and other you know, policemen, but uh, no, no recollection. Well, there were, only, there were only two of them. There were only two of them. They were both in the aeronautical engineering business. Fred McMurray, my three sons, yes. And then the, the astronaut on I Dream of Jeannie. Here's the other guy. <laughs> but no city traffic engineers, you know? Um, one of my favorite engineering stories is there, there were four guys playing golf, and um, the attorney, doctor, uh, lawyer, and engineer. And they were, uh, they were being held up a lot this afternoon, you know? Guys kept, <clears throat> in front of them, kept wandering back and forth from one side to the other. And uh, so the greenskeeper came by and they said, hey, wh what's with these guys? You know, they can't seem to, you know, get on and play the game of golf. And he said, well, those are our blind firefighters. They saved our clubhouse, so we let them play any time they want. And the uh, attorney said, oh, I'm going to look into their legal status and see if we can get them some help. Doctor said, I'll look into the latest, you know. I uh, talked to the ophthalmologist, and the, um, <clears throat> the minister said, I'm going to pray for him. And the whole time, the engineer was staring up in the sky, and he said, these guys could play at night. <laughs> <laughs> we have some radical things going on in transportation, so I'll try to make the traffic engineering profession as exciting as possible to you tonight, um, because there is really a lot going on. Um, <clears throat> uh, as Vince said, I started with Florida DOT. Actually, um, I even started with the Florida State Road Department way back in 1968, between sophomore and junior years at Tech. I was in Florida, and I, I, I held that rod out there with the uh, survey crew for the Florida State Road Department. And of course, uh, the transportation, the Department of Transportation for Florida, FDOT, uh, like many other agencies transitioning into that multimodal name of Department of Transportation, 
sometimes had a little difficulty getting away from their old state road department, state highway department, uh, uh, thinking and attitudes and everything else. But that's changing pretty rapidly. And I'll go into some of that um, and explain uh, how. <clears throat> so uh, it's been a long run. I did uh, work on MPOs, Metropolitan Planning Organizations in Florida, and worked their computer models to simulate 25 and 30 year traffic into the future so we could decide how many lanes to make these highways and freeways. Boy, was that exciting. Until I found out that there are much more exciting things to do. Uh, I left DOT and started doing traffic impact studies for many developments in Florida. They had a process called DRI, Development of Regional Impact, because there were so many abuses of major developments in South Florida, they would do 12 and 15 mile, square mile developments and just load the, the trips in there and uh, bring people in in jet airplanes and sell them Florida lots. You know, so they, they put a stop to a lot of that with this development of regional impact law. And so I had uh, done about 50 DRIs doing a lot of throughout Florida. And there was a new one that came up in the panhandle of Florida, um, uh, sometimes called UCLA, the upper corner of lower Alabama. <laughs> and uh, when we need a little boost, you know. Um, and that was called Seaside. And I had never heard of uh, Seaside, I'd never heard of any of the uh, people involved. And so they sent me their plans, um, and I rolled them out of my desk. And I saw they had 12 intersections hooking into an arterial highway within a half a mile. A half a mile. And I was about to tell Andres Tuani and Robert Davis that, uh, you know, guys, this is not going to work. We don't do things this way, because I had not been converted at that point. So I held my fire, and, um, and they told me they were trying to do the first walkable community from scratch since before 1930. Before 1930. Because ever since, since 1930, everything had gone toward the automobile and serving the automobile. And that was the paradigm shift. <clears throat> so I, uh, uh, they, they, they loaded Sundog Books, the bookstore in Seaside, with all these architecture and, and new urbanism books. And I was browsing along one day and, and came across one that said, oh, Death and Life of Great American Cities. What a catchy title. And it was Jane Jacobs, wonderful 1961 document on uh, studies that she had done in New York City, just revolutionary work. Uh, so I, I thought I came around to it pretty quickly. My wife said it took me a long time to get the engineer out of my head. And, um, and so I've been doing new urbanism work ever since and have been fortunate enough to work with Vince on a couple of projects. Um, <clears throat> then, now, and tomorrow, what a span of, of, of excitement in this, this particular field. Um, and, and I want to focus on context and mobility. Context and mobility, the placemaking of the context how do you define that? How do you tell people what it is? And the mobility is how you get around, whether you're walking or riding a bike or taking a bus or getting in a car. And so the, the combination where those two come together, there's often a good deal of turbulence there because of a misunderstanding of place and an old thinking about mobility and how one should design. <coughs> so there's an SOS happening in the term we call walkability. Um, walkability really means walking, biking, and transit, but it's so hard when you have to say all three of those words every time, so we just sum it up with walkability. And it's SOS because we, um, we have a, a solution that will take care of the walkability, and it is share or separate. SOS, share or separate. Really the problem, I've tried to state it here, there are many ways to state it, the dominance of the motor vehicle is the problem and the, and the speed differential between the automobile and your walking along. And that difference in speed of travel makes your two modes or your mobility incompatible. Um, <clears throat> And, and this challenges the pedestrians because the, the, they become um, an extinct species. 
as soon as the speed goes above 35 miles an hour. You just don't see people uh, that have any choice in their life um, walking next to a, a highway that goes, has 45, 55 mile per hour traffic. It's just extremely uncomfortable and dangerous. Um, so we're trying to restore the balance between all those modes and, and one, of the, one of the few ways to do it is to get the motor vehicles to slow down. You've got to get them to slow down in the presence of pedestrians when you're crossing streets like these wonderful streets right out here. <coughs> so th that's the context and mobility um, uh, uh, kind of friction that's going on. That is the essence of the problem. Now I've got a, uh, a slide here uh, that, that tries to identify the root cause of the degradation of our cities and towns. And uh, I'm, I'm trying this for the first time tonight. I'm trying to zoom in on part of this because it's a fairly good, a large slide. And this uh, question though is, all right, the last two, Mrs. Public, please ID who's responsible for your city's land use decline and traffic problems. So it's a police lineup. And all the criminals are lined up there and we're trying to identify which one actually caused the problem. <clears throat> so over here, <clears throat> is it the sprawl developers uh, by this heinous looking goat that's eating all the dishes? Or is it the MPO, which I did work for many years, a metropolitan planning organization? And the MPO decision maker here is being tempted by a mislevel of service. That measure of, measure of speed and delay for the automobiles only. Level of service has nothing to do with pedestrians. They've tried to spruce it up and have, well, let's have bicycle level of service and pedestrian level of service, but it just hasn't worked out. So, um, and, and look who's in cahoots with the level of service technique, <clears throat> the politicians. And they're turning the money spigot on and <laughs> this guy has the federal subsidies by the engineering and, and the contractors are feeding at the trough, so to speak. Um, so those are potential folks that are causing the trouble. And then <clears throat> here is a, a very major cause, and I'll go into that a little bit more. The automakers, the automakers are a major contributor to the kind of sprawl development that we've experienced. Um, and the car defines you, it says here on their ad. Uh, and here's big oil, they always, you know, <clears throat> if you, the more oil you buy, the more, uh, <clears throat> they, uh, they prosper. Um, here's an anchor, the transportation policy of the 50s. And then in cahoots over here, the big box operators and the truckers. You know, bringing that stuff all the way from California and, uh, uh, and China and selling it to you at the lowest possible price, <clears throat> which forces you actually to get in your car and drive to the warehouse. See, before 1930, um, the goods were brought to the warehouse and then there was a distributor that took it from the warehouse to the store and you just went to the store, you didn't go to the warehouse. But people said, let's cut out the middleman. Let's get rid of that expensive, wasteful middleman. Well, the truth is, looking back on it now, that middleman was always a lot of help when you went in with, uh, with a, a problem on what kind of cloth to buy to make a dress or the or the woodworking shop to make the table. You, you need somebody experienced to talk to. And, and that person is now gone. So you have to Google it and look it up on the internet. Um, <clears throat> then there's the, the general public that is uh, also uh, a potential person in the lineup here. But here's the traffic engineer standing alone. Pick her, pick her, please, not me again. It's not my fault. So he's trying to get the um, the person on the lineup to pick the Girl Scout selling cookies. So he doesn't get blamed for the, the sprawl that is, uh, that is so evident out there. Um, here's a guy who has really nailed the reason we got into this pickle that we're in now. Uh, he's a historian. He's not a, an architect or an engineer or developer. He's a historian. Um, he was in... Um, What's that coastal North Carolina town that always gets hit by the hurricanes? On the coast, right on the coast. Wilmington, Wilmington. He had a job in Wilmington um, documenting old historic photographs that this very energetic photographer took from 
uh, something like 1905 to 1960. A uh, big long span of time, and he had all these photographs. And he was documenting each one. And then he would go out in the evening <coughs> and look around, and he said, wait a minute, <coughs> in these photographs, I saw a lot of people walking around and riding bicycles. And I go out, and nobody's there anymore. In fact, six blocks of urbanization had been flattened uh, in, in the time between when he's looking at these photographs and when he sees the reality of what's out there today. So he's, this, this got his imagination. So <clears throat> being a curious historian, he uh, researched through newspaper and, and book prints and, and, and all the historic evidence he could pull together uh, what happened. He's also a UVA um, uh, professor now and, uh, and is an excellent lecturer. And this is his book, Fighting Traffic. And he was after when, when the streets became auto-dominant. How did we lose that walking uh, feature? And he, he focused on the time period between 1900 and 1940, just that short 40-year period. Um, and he, he documents that first the automobiles were unwanted. They were uninvited in the cities. Uh, New Orleans, Cincinnati, New York, the urban pattern was already established. You went down to the corner grocer to get your, your bacon, and, and you, you got some uh, fresh uh, vegetables almost every day. And, and that was within a walking distance. I was in New Orleans recently, and I, a friend of mine was driving me around, and every, every quarter mile to half mile, there was a chamfered building. You know, you get to the street corner, and it was a 45 degree angle where the door was. That was a signal that that was a store. So you would walk down and buy what you needed at that store. They were the, the walking 7-Eleven stores, you know. <clears throat> so he did all this research. Um, and there were so many deaths that were happening with the new automobile. Uh, in New York, there was a 100,000 person protest march against the, the slaughter of the, of the, uh, the kids from the, the speeding automobiles. Um, in 1924, this is really an important pivot point in that whole span of 40 years, 1924. In 1923, motordom, which they call themselves, the auto uh, industry called themselves motordom, uh, they had a bad sales year in the urban settings. So all their records came in and said, oh man, we've had a terrible drop in sales. It was before the depression, so they were very concerned about this. This was a time when there were uh, 60 or 80 automobile manufacturers. It's kind of like in the dot-com when everybody was starting up. And then it consolidated into Ford, GM, and Chrysler. Um, but they were very nervous, so they said in 1924, we're pulling away. They were sitting around at tables talking with the aggrieved parents, the uh, uh, department store owners, the city traffic engineers, and trying to work this out. How do we get the automobile to work effectively in our cities? And, and they had that bad sales year, so they, they pulled away. And they began taking their financial resources and pouring them into government influence. And Hoover was, our, was very effective in the Department of Commerce and then later as president. He was an engineer, mining engineer. <coughs> but he, um, he began to invite industry in to committees and, and conferences to say, well, what do you folks think at that time? What do you guys think? Uh, about how we should run this, uh, this business. And um, they began in, in, uh, with a great deal of self-interest to modify laws and regulations in the United States that moved us toward the automobile dominance which benefited them. Um, there, were, um, there were a group of engineers that first worked on the rural highways and got America out of the mud, so to speak. And so they were heroes, they did wonderful highways out in the rural area. Uh, so when this problem came up with motordom, they were invited into the city, said, come on in, you've done such a wonderful job. And so they started building highways in the cities, because that's what they were used to. Pro you know, sections of, of five and six miles that didn't change at all, you know, uh, unlike the city uh, patterns. Um, so motordom just left the table, and, um, and this is what Peter, um, documents in this wonderful book. So this is a strong recommendation to read if you want to know the history of how things got to be the way that they are right now.
This is a, one of his collected images. Um, this is in Detroit. And, and look at the people just walking uh, at will uh, through the streets. The, the streetcars were in the middle, so everybody was, was free to walk to the center and wait there and then get on the streetcar or get off and then walk to the side. And the few automobiles uh, in there are, are having to stop for all these pedestrians. Well, that, as you know, got rearranged pretty dramatically. Uh, and, and the term jaywalking got, um, got uh, coined and, and used pretty viciously. Uh, th there was a lot of um, contentiousness about this. It was a huge fight. And here's a, a political cartoon where uh, the, the reckless and vicious drivers, um, not, not, uh, they're, they're not holding any punches off here. And they're, they're feeding, these are actually bodies of small, uh, small individuals, they're feeding them to the, to the uh, you know, aggressive automobile. Uh, and Motordom didn't like this one bit. So they, these are monuments that were put up in, in two cities um, dedicated to the fallen children, uh, because it was a really serious problem. This one <laughs> says, nothing is more precious than a child's life, you know, right here. So it was a huge deal and a lot of contentious uh, discussion. And there were certain laws that were put in place, or at least proposed, to um, control the automobiles. Some of the speed limits for downtowns were like 15 miles per hour, 10 miles per hour. And so the, um, the automotive interests said, you cannot hog tie the automobile that way. You must have the freedom of the open road. Um, <clears throat> so notice that they're not saying uh, the automobile is much more efficient. You know, in fact, at that time, the transit people with their streetcars were trying to retaliate and say, we have the most efficient transportation mode, stick with us. Um, but efficiency has never won the hearts of Americans. It's always the emotion, the, um, <clears throat> the freedom to do what you want to do, and you know, don't tread on me. That's the way we are as a country, and we still are. Um, so uh, we have begun in our quest for greater walkability to say we want to give you the freedom of four modes of transportation. You will not just be stuck with one mode when you live out there, uh, or you get too old to drive any longer. Keys are encouraged away from you by your children. Uh, that's, that's a serious problem when you're too young to drive. It's another problem. So get the freedom of four modes of transportation. And, and we're not going with efficiency. We're going with freedom uh, as the counterway. And jaywalking was invented as a term. Uh, that hayseed uh, reference, you know, the jaywalker, it didn't even exist up until this period uh, before they pulled away. And uh, laws got put in, in, uh, in place, supported by groups like AAA, the American Automobile Association. Uh, and, and other uh, associations like that. <clears throat> Here's another very good book, The Option of Urbanism by Chris Leinberger, <clears throat> Investing in a New American Dream. So he is in the real estate business, and he's a developer, and he has, has really qu uh, quantified in this book two types of place, two types of context for America, and they are the drivable suburban and the walkable urban. He says, there is nothing else. And he said, now you do have universities and airports and industrial sites, unusual things like that. But it, by and large, you have either uh, suburban, uh, drivable suburban or walkable urban. And um, the, um, the drivable suburban has much lower density, floor area ratio. Um, and the, the, there's the LOS again, the LOS. Uh, is the default way to, to measure the effectiveness of your street network because it favors the automobile. And um, 45 mile per hour I mentioned. But here's the separation of all the elements. Both the land use is separated far from each other, so you have to drive a long distance. Uh, how many of you have just become frustrated on a Saturday? You, you have like three errands and you have to go 76 miles, you know, <laughs> take care of all those errands. Um, so the separation of the places is very important. 
but it's also the separation of the travel modes within the street. You have a lane for the vehicles, you have a lane for the pedestrians, which is called a sidewalk, and you have a bike lane for the bicycles. Because if the car is gonna go 45, you can't share it. You cannot share it. So it's, we call them the separatists, the people that want to, to separate all the modes and keep them out of each other's way. Uh, th but if you're in an urban walkable place, then the floor area ratio, that's the, the floor area times the, um, um, the, the total floor area divided by the lot size. Um, when you get FARs up in the, from 0.8 up to 40, then, then you, you're close enough to each other uh, in, your, in your relationships with people and your, your shopping places and schools and places of worship that you can actually walk over there and then walk over here and then walk to the post office and then walk back home. And, and so it's that, um, it's that closeness uh, of scale like you experience here at ION that, um, that gives you that, that urban walkable condition. And the, as I said, the speeds have to be 30 or less. They cannot be 35 and 45. So that's a good book to read. So the, 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 the share or separate, this is in Stockholm, Sweden, and, and they have a, uh, a lot shared, but the, this bicycle lane uh, is separated on the larger street that has faster moving traffic. Um, <clears throat> a couple of examples, this is Winter Park, Florida, north of Orlando, and it looks like it's been there 120 years. It's only about uh, eight or nine years old. Uh, this is a project Victor Dover worked on and, uh, and designed. And you see the building is back of the sidewalk and then there are trees and there are parked cars uh, in that, that close proximity. So then the bicycles and the pedestrians uh, can peacefully coexist with the automobiles. And so that gets my five walking uh, 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 grade for this particular scene. And this is a, a neighborhood in which I used to live um, it only gets two walkers because there is a sidewalk, Ta -da. but nobody ever walks out there because when we were in school, I was at Virginia Tech and we learned about highway engineering. At that time, the only way to slow the vehicles down was to introduce a curve into the street because that's what those rural highway designers brought with them from the country, okay? So in, in the... Um, in the uh, design speed definition, um, the, the recommended uh, uh, lower speeds were all, you had to introduce a curve. But you also, when you have a curve, you introduce super elevation. Super elevation is what they have at uh, the NASCAR tracks, you know, where it's at a high tilt so you can go faster and faster and not fly off the road. Look at the super elevation in, in this stretch of it. When you turn back in that corner, you're, you're at a tilt like that. And that just encourages faster speed. And, um, and here's the separatists again. Here's the, the bicycle and then the, uh, I mean the pedestrian bicycle, wide lanes, a flip-flop lane in the middle in case you might want to turn in somewhere. And so it begins to look like an airport taxiway. Um, and, and people just, they fly. Drivers recognize this as a fast place to drive. Subconsciously, because nothing is going by your uh, peripheral vision very fast at all. Now take this place, this is Miami Beach, um, uh, highly walkable uh, because the buildings are close, you have trees and, and, and the speeds are very, very slow. Um, let's look at uh, Seaside for a moment. This is, this is one I stumbled onto in, in 1984 uh, when there was only half of one street built over here, Tupelo Street. And this was designed for uh, walkability. This is a central square. Um, and you see the cars are all present. We're, we're not anti-automobile. We're not going to banish them. We're, we don't want car-free cities. We want the car to be there because we know the carpenter has to get down and, and, and work on your apartment uh, or the dishwasher repair person or the delivery person. You have to be able to drive within the urban setting. The key is you just have to behave when you're there with, uh, behind the wheel. And this is Robert Davis here in the center, um, the, the, the kind of the father of Seaside, town founder. So he, he does for Seaside what, um, what Vince did for Ion right here. Um, now that's, and this is what it looks like 
you can, you can tell with these mini dune walkovers that you see um, that even from a lot way back here, you can still walk down through here and walk and then uh, get into a place where you have a dune walkover. And so uh, people all the way in the back have a value at the, for their real estate that is sufficiently high. Um, you also are comfortable with your nine or 10 year old child being on their own to go from the back all the way to the beach. And that's a very uh, relaxing feeling when you know the safety is there uh, for them. Uh, now there's, and, and Tom Lowe did this drawing. Um, uh, there's Robert Davis' Seaside. And then here is uh, Seaside without Robert Davis. Um, now let me go back and forth a little bit here. There's Robert's, and there's without. There's Robert, there's without. Now let me explain. Uh, you have the three pods of single family, um, you know, homes from the 200s and homes from the 300s and homes from the 400s, um, the way they market that stuff. This is what Andres calls the train wreck style of apartment uh, development, where nobody looks in anyone else's window. Uh, and this is the strip mall where you have the nail place and the pizza place and, uh, you know, and the beach ball place. And then uh, on the beach, to, to, to capitalize on that view, you have the high-rise developments that get put right on the edge of the beach. And uh, we have seen so much of this that it's not uh, too hard to get more excited about this instead. And these are the 12 streets that I noticed in 1984 that were intersecting with this arterial. And uh, that's, I couldn't believe they were doing it, but they did, and I'm really glad they did. Um, this is a project, we worked on a project in uh, Savannah, and uh, this is part of the interstate spur that comes into downtown uh, Savannah, and um, it, it really is invasive. I, I was talking to the city engineers for Savannah, and uh, they said, you know, our streets in Savannah are substandard. We have substandard streets in Savannah. Well, that's because all the manuals that they look at, you know, and are all suburban. So the Savannah streets are not like the suburban streets, and I was thinking, hallelujah, this is the way we need them, narrow and parked and slow. And they were all saying, well, these are all substandard. And, and until the best engineers that go to work in the Savannahs and the Charlestons and, and the Key Wests and everywhere else uh, get a sense of pride from the streets that are highly walkable, uh, we're not going to make any progress in this whole approach. So I immediately thought of uh, Captain Nemo with uh, 2,000 Leagues Under the Sea when they were battling this uh, squid invasion that was, was coming into the street system of Savannah. So I was thinking, let's get the axes out and let's cut that sucker off. You know, let's, uh, let's take care of that. Um, and there were other people that knew what was going on and that things were going in the wrong direction. You remember I mentioned 1924 as motordom's shift. Well, here's in 1926, right in the same era, John Nolan, a very experienced and talented urban designer that was doing the same thing then that Andres and Victor and, uh, uh, you know, are doing, are doing today. Um, and Vince, he said the solution is, is uh, not so much by wider streets, but let's get a better plan for the town which is what has happened here. Um, so, so, welcome to ION. So I'm gonna show you just a few things with a little, uh, a little bit of a, uh, a, a focus on the mobility issues here in ION. Um, this particular street has a, a kink in it at the end. You never see that in suburbia. You know, they're all smooth and, and uh, are even perfectly straight. That, that little twist at the end of that street slows it down so you won't race into that um, street intersection going too fast. Of course, the buildings are to the back of the sidewalk and the trees and you have parallel parked cars. Parallel parked cars, critical, critical. And uh, we'll talk a, a good bit about that. The welcoming benches. Um, and, and look at the fun you can have in a livable community. This is a, a Huck Finn kind of moment that these guys are having in the lake. These are 10 years ago. 
These are 10 years ago. Um, you know, this, this guy's probably in college now. <laughs> so, uh, you know, the beautiful porches and, and the, you know, the low country uh, stairs that come up from both sides, one for the men, one for the women. <laughs> That's the way they got started. That was the origin of that double. Of course, there was symmetry also. There was symmetry. And uh, uh, I, I was talking to Vince. When I, was, when I was 12 years old, I'd lived in Europe for six years because my father was in the Air Force. And um, so when, one of the three-year stints we had was at Versailles, south of Paris. So I knew all about stairs like this. And that began to come back when I was listening to these good urban designers. So the porches that you, you know, we know again, after a long spate of an amnesia, that if you're gonna do residential, it has to be elevated. So you have a sense of privacy being that close to the street. So you walk out on your porch and somebody's walking by, Sarah, hello, how are you? And she's down there. Um, and and when, they, when people walk by, uh, they can look through your windows, but they see chandeliers. They don't see what you're, oh, they're having spaghetti tonight, you know, <laughs> looking, looking down at them. But then commercial is just the reverse. You, you want to have your commercial be sidewalk entry um, because that's, that's the convenient way to, you don't want to climb a lot of stairs for commercial. So those, those uh, were tried and true. Everybody that was designing in 19, oh, 1910, knew that. And then there was this decline due to the depression and they were all out of business and the, the suburban people came charging back. Um, wonderful, look at that curve in this road. Now that's not absolutely essential, it was put in there on purpose, okay, to keep the speed on that edge down. Um, and, and the roads get much more casual as you go out toward the, uh, the, the, the rural edge. Um, look at this, a, a youngster who again is probably in college um, is there with a UPS truck mixing it up and, uh, and, and you know, doing a fine job of it because of the low speed. Speed management is critical and it happens all the time. Um, I'm not sure you're doing this anymore. Um, that edge of that triangle needs to be parked again. That edge right out here next to that street needs to be parallel parked again. Now, I, I understand that somebody like the driver of this van coming up to that was nervous about that. And that's why it's gone. Now, it was um, to, the, to the road behind the land park? Yes. Here's the solution. This, this person in the white van is feeling nervous, and I'm saying, yes, you got it right. The drivers have to feel nervous. You have crashes when the drivers are completely comfortable going as fast as they want to go. Okay? And I, I, I know nobody's been killed at this intersection. Okay? There are probably not even any crashes at this intersection of record. So. Get the car parked cars out there. The, the, the sight triangles that, that we engineers uh, insist on are one more thing we brought in from the country. We brought it in from the country. The high speed, you know, you're out on, on a rural two lane road next to a bunch of feet, uh, pulp wood and cornfields. Uh, you don't want to have a surprise by somebody pulling out uh, in your path because you're going way too fast to stop. But here the secret is, if everybody's going 15 or 20, you can stop and nobody gets killed. That's the key difference. Speed of the motor vehicles really, number one is speed of the motor vehicles, number two is the motor vehicle speed, and number three is how fast the cars are going. <laughs> That's it. That's the secret. Now you'll love this. This is my, uh, my 10 year old photograph. Look at the tree and, and how thin it is and everything. And then, uh, aha, the church is now here. See, future home of Holy Cross Church. And there it is. And look at the difference in that tree size. Okay. So, uh, and look how wonderfully the church uh, fills in the town center with a civic building right there. Uh, so it's all about creating the place. And
and the transportation must be subordinate to that. The traffic engineers have no right to get out ahead of the urban designers. Zero. Uh, this is a, a great street. It's a great street because it's been allowed to be narrower to protect the pedestrians. <clears throat> Let me move into an, another uh, area, context. Um, we are so inept at describing context or place um, that, that all we have is rural or urban. Uh, when you look at all the Federal Highway Administration uh, regulations and all the important decisions on where to spend money and what, how wide the lane should be, it's either, well, that's, a, that's an urban section or that's a rural section. That's it. And, and obviously there are many more gradations of uh, uh, place that are much more important. Um, and there's a, there's a poor assumption that, that we can speed and be safe if we just get on the large arterials. That's another problem, that, that, that speed is, is safe, safe to travel. And I don't know how they continue to um, perpetrate that, that myth, so to speak, but a lot of people are catching on to it and they're fighting the, the high speeds. Um, and, and they're always administering funds based on this urban and rural mix of, of street types. Um, now the great delegation, um, that's a term we've come up with for the way the transportation system works. Think of the whole system as being a train system where you have locomotives and, uh, and track. And, um, and the, the government at all levels has delegated all of the stuff that has to do with the locomotive to you and you and you, okay? You do the vehicle technology selection. You do the research on color and stereo systems and whatever else you want, convertible or hard top. You do all of that. Uh, if you didn't do it and there, were, there was a train uh, 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 agency or an agency of transportation, they still have to make the vehicle technology research and selection. It's very expensive for them. They train their drivers to run transit vehicles. You train yourself. So there's this delegation down to each of us, and it goes, it fits in very nicely with that independence that I talked about earlier, this freedom to, I mean, any one of us in here uh, could go get in their cars and drive to Chicago tonight if you wanted to. You wouldn't have to check a schedule or check the fare or anything else. Um, so that's the, uh, that's the seductive nature of the automobile. Um, and, and it's that great delegation down to the individuals. And that has to change to a degree where you want the compact urban places to be. So you, again, we're back to context, determining how you organize the mobility systems. Uh, speed kills, I said this a couple times already, and there's an old study we, we, we like to use, we've been using it for 25 years, that said, if, if you as a pedestrian are struck by a motor vehicle, unfortunately, if that motor vehicle is going 20 miles an hour, there's only a 5% chance that you'll be a fatality. If the vehicle is going 30, it jumps to over 50, and if it's going 40, yeah, it's 80%. You have a 20% chance of surviving a strike by an automobile if it's going 40 miles an hour. So it's an exponential rise uh, and, and it's just high school physics of force equals mass times acceleration um, of how, how difficult it is. This is another way to put it. This is uh, street injury and, and uh, street width, uh, pedestrian injury and street width. Uh, this is street width, 10 foot wide uh, streets from curb to curb, 20, 30. Um, your, your main uh, street right over here is 30 feet from curb to curb. Um, and so you're down on the safe part of this curve. As soon as you get to 40, look how it goes up, and 50 goes up. Um, so it's a dangerous place to be out there. Um, now, just looking over the shoulders of Victor and Andres and, and Steph Palazoides and, and 10, 10 or so other good urban designers, top notch, uh, we've developed this top 10 walkability factor, David Letterman countdown backwards, okay? <laughs> Uh, narrow streets are very important, as I've told you. Uh, street trees are very important. 
street trees um, not only shade the pedestrians in August, but they also give the driver a sense that, oh, I'm, I'm in a place where this, that I need to slow down because these trees are whipping by me if I'm trying to do 40 miles an hour. So subconsciously, you, you slow down when the trees are going by your peripheral vision. Uh, traffic volumes, you'd like to have lower volumes. You know. Sidewalks, some people might think sidewalks should be in the top three. Not so, and I'll show you why. Uh, interconnected streets, you need a web of small blocks, uh, small uh, connections like you have here. Uh, on-street parking, very important, because that on-street parking um, gives you that same driver sense of, uh, I should slow down, this is a place where I should be more cautious. Um, but also, uh, uh, my wife's an English major, and, and so she loves alliteration and, and these kind of things. And we trade puns all the time. But parking produces pedestrians. Parking produces pedestrians. If somebody's unfortunate and can't live in Ion and they're two miles away, they can drive here and go to one of the shops, and they can then go get lunch, and then they can, uh, then they can leave. And they, they really trick or treat. <laughs> yeah, they come here to trick or treat, right? Um, oh, while I'm thinking about it, the um, boutique across the street, what's the name of it? I want to thank them. They let me use their internet to download those slides from, from Peter Norton. Uh, I just got those in today. And I want to shout out to them as being very helpful. Um, lower traffic speeds, we've covered that. Um, mixed land use. If, if two square miles of land use are all the same, like the office park, then you really don't have much of a purpose to go visit anybody on close quarters so, so you don't walk. Um, and a mix of land use is very important. Buildings fronting the street, it gives you that enclosure once again. Pedestrians are not comfortable walking with nothing to their right and left. Uh, that's just a, a psychological thing we do. Number one, small block size. Um, if you lose everything else, if a hurricane levels your town, uh, you, if you have small block size, you can rebuild and, and get back to where you need to be. Um, so uh, that's, our, that's the most important one. So design speeds, we've categorized them on as, as uh, free speed for us is 35. And then, uh, I'm sorry, speed street is 35, free street is 30, uh, slow is 20, and yield is 15. And I can give you street designs that will give you an average speed of each of these to the nearest five miles per hour. We know how to do that. Um, and the reason we know how to do that is um, I have a handy little device in here called a speed gun. This is a modern speed gun. It's a radar gun. You push that red button on this side and hold it out, and the speed of the motor vehicle shows up on this screen on this side. So this is with me every time I travel. And so uh, I can look at the composition of a street based on these factors that I've gone through, and, uh, and then take this, I can guess the speed before I take it, and it's always you know, within about five miles per hour being correct. So once you get attuned to this, then you, you, you too can have one of these. You can get it for $1.99 on Amazon. You can have it three days. And I, if you're really interested in this stuff, I mean, if, if you have a homeowners association and you want to impress the uh, planning commission, and you walk in and if you say, walk in and say, oh, speeds are kind of high out there, um, that's not as impressive as if we took an average of 12 shots and they were all within 40, uh, 42 to 44 miles per hour. It's called a pocket radar. Pocket radar, $200. Um, so that's how we know this. Uh, then, of course, the fire chief always has to say, I've got to get my big trucks around the corner. And we also always hear, why don't you just get smaller trucks? <laughs> mm, and, and that's complicated because the, 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 the firemen get paid more for driving bigger trucks than smaller trucks. That's the way the pay scale goes. But also, they have a, a, a number of functions that are on each truck. And they're either, uh, they're either a quad, where they have four functions, or a quint, where they have five functions. Uh, and those functions are 
um, they can be first on the scene and, and dispense first aid like an ambulance. They can be there for uh, an emergency spill. I was on Tennessee Street in Tallahassee, and uh, there was this truck that was having trouble, you know, letting the clutch out, and it went, nah, 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 and, and a 50-gallon drum of yellow paint fell off the back. It started spreading all down the, the slight hill on Tennessee Street. And so within, within minutes, uh, a vehicle like this was there. They had sand, they had shovels, they were taking care of all this stuff. So they do a lot more than just put out the fires. So that's, that's what they tell us anyway. It's really mostly about getting insurance for your house. If you don't have a travel time within a certain range, there's a formula calculated by a company up in New England somewhere that says yes or no on your insurance. And so uh, that's, that's another key part of that. You have some, a great diversity of thoroughfare types in ION, from the, the, the uh, small, comfortable lane all the way up through the large street. And, and I, I love the way these are done because a large street still only 30 feet wide. That's, that's the largest one you have. Um, and this service lane is, is really important um, because that gets you to the rear garages and, and uh, the rear entry on these houses. Because if you all have the garages up front, you know that it's not comfortable to walk in front of a bunch of garage doors. Um, so nine feet, these are great dimensions. Um, there's that, that uh, and there's a playground opportunity, see, back behind. Um, uh, then, then the road is more of a rural thing. You don't have uh, curbs necessarily on a, on a road. Um, now this one got built a little too large, two 10-foot lanes next to each other, because during the discussion and debate during the, the, the implementation after the charrette, the, the reviewers at the county, I believe it was, um, did the town did not let them do two nine-foot lanes. Two nine-foot lanes would have yielded slower traffic. So um, uh, there's, there's more effort out there now. There's now parallel parking and, uh, and some things to slow it down. Um, beautiful street, gosh. Victor Dover, I, I'm guessing, when he came to talk to you, said, we have to make these streets beautiful. They have to give you mobility, but they have to be beautiful. And that's the place-making emphasis he puts on it. And the small street, um, you know, a, a 10-foot lane, maybe one way, uh, with a 7-foot parking. And those don't always have to be one way. Um, Tom Lowe did a street in uh, north of Charlotte, uh, and he worked out with the traffic engineer what the square would be in the middle of town. And the traffic engineer said, all right, you're going to mark this one one way here and one way there, and yeah, stop signs and crosswalks and everything. Tom said, yeah, yeah, yeah. Tom never gotten around to putting those in. People come into the corner of that square, and it's just asphalt, not even any sign. And he just lets it flow however the people want. They come up there, some go right, some go left, some go right. They park where they want to on the square. So it, there's really a whole lot more control than is absolutely necessary. Um, and this is your basic uh, workhorse street, two eights and a six, I'm sorry, two eight foot wide travel lanes and a six foot parking lane on the side. Now in suburbia, most of the parking lanes are mandated for eight feet wide. That's because the largest vehicle allowed by law is eight feet wide. Most vehicles are only, passenger vehicles are only six feet wide, minus the mirrors. But I notice when I drive around Ion, uh, most people have, uh, especially with the nicer cars, the mirrors all fold in. That's a very good thing to have uh, when you're on an efficient street like this. So uh, six feet is a great parking width and, and the eight foot lanes are great. Uh, and this, it gets you to your large street. Um, uh, and we, we just rattled through these numbers. This is a 6996. It's got two six-foot parking lanes and, uh, and two nine-foot uh, uh, travel lanes. Seaside has the majority of the residential streets in Seaside um, are uh, n two nine-foot lanes in the middle and then two nine-foot lanes on the edge because it's right up against a picket fence. So if you parked your car, you have to be able to open the door. See? So you can't do six-foot parking with a picket fence on the side. So we call them the German streets. Nine, 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 nine. <laughs> okay? 
to, uh, you know, we have to generate ways to remember things, you know. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, well, um, notice those buildings are two-story, you know, again, the context, if you're way out on the edge of your context toward your lower density, then sometimes you don't need sidewalks. Um, in Seaside, they, they did sidewalks in the town center, Seaside Avenue that went out to the northeast, and then they sat back and watched, and the, there were still strolling babies in the middle of the lane on Seaside Avenue when they had the sidewalks built for them. So they said, hmm, that's the last sidewalk we're going to build. So the rest of Seaside has the 9999, and everybody walks on the, on the brick streets, and it works just fine. We did, a, we did a speed study and a transportation uh, study for Vince uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and these were the places where we uh, had speed um, counting devices uh, and then just volumes at the green spots. So the, uh, the, the orange ones had speed and volume and the green just had uh, volume. Um, this is maybe a little hard to read, but when you look at Shellmore uh, north and southbound in the red and white, and then East Lake northbound, southbound, and then um, Ponsbury um, north and south. And, and these are the speed ranges that we measured out there. So um, almost everybody was, was at 25 miles per hour or less. Now there are, are a few, when you get away from this cluster, over in here are the, uh, are the folks that are traveling faster, 25 to 30, and then a couple of bad boys were out here at 35. Um, one thing to remember is that probably time of day had a great influence on this. Um, when um, there's a point in the middle of the afternoon when everybody's off working somewhere or off shopping and there's not enough parking, to provide that resistance to the street. So, so there can be some speeding in the, in the middle of the afternoon. Uh, there can also be some speeding late at night when there's just no pedestrian activity. So there are a lot of factors that come in, in, into play. Uh, but generally, the street design that I've been talking about in lanes and trees and buildings takes care of your speed uh, situation in Ion. When was that study? That was 10 years ago. Now, we've, again, I had my speed gun in Key West, two eight-foot lanes, 28 miles an hour. And I was up in uh, Ocean Grove, New Jersey, um, and the average speed was 20 because they had 12-foot lanes, but they were on angle parking. Um, and then I went a little bit over in, in Asbury Park, New Jersey, and they had 17-foot lanes, and the stalls were 16, and speed jumps to 30, 33 miles an hour. It's just... It just follows like day and night that street width and uh, speed are, are right there together. Uh, near Birmingham, Homewood, Alabama, 28 uh, feet gave us 26 miles an hour. Um, <clears throat> now, notice this big truck kind of holding back um, uh, uh, and, and while the SUV goes in between. This is one of your 30-foot uh, streets. And then when that SUV is gone, there comes the truck, and the truck goes on by, and, and there, it worked. It, it's the traffic calming and the speed management that you're really after. Speed management is, is based on design, education, and enforcement. You've got to design it well, like, like ION has, um, and then you've got to educate folks about it pretty much constantly. Uh, and then you always have to get some kind of enforcement uh, to really close the, the loop. I'm not sure what kind of enforcement you do have, but, um, but it's often hard to get enforcement on, um, in the private uh, uh, subdivisions.
there, there, are, there are state laws that say the minimum speed you can post on a residential street is often 30 miles an hour. Um, and, but there's always that little clause on the bottom that says, unless you have a study that is performed and signed by a registered professional engineer, that would be me. <laughs> I'm registered in 22 states because these, these new urbanists travel far and wide. And uh, we've been to Saudi Arabia and Ecuador, and uh, it gets pretty exciting. But, um, but you, have to, um, you have to get somebody that's registered to give you that report to place on the docket as evidence uh, that you're setting the speed correctly. This is a real clever uh, design uh, that, that was, uh, if not pioneered here, is an early adopter of it. You get the, make the pavement rougher uh, for a corner that's pretty sharp, and, and this allows the largest vehicle allowed by law to make it around that corner, but most uh, of the automobiles don't really want to bother to get over on that rough pavement. And, and so um, we've developed this further. We have what we call a safety strip that goes down the middle of, of a two-lane street, separating the lanes. So if you have parking here and somebody's parking like this, you can go into the safety strip, get around them, and continue. That's for a higher volume situation than you have here. So, um, and AASHTO, the American Association of State Highway and Transportation Officials, they, they, they uh, set these, these uh, street design guidelines. They say the first step in the design process to find the function that the facility is to serve. We agree, but we would like to have the opportunity to say that a valid function is walkability for a community. So um, that's, that's, that's what we're working on right now. Uh, we're kind of moving into a little bit of the future of what we would like to see happen. Um, thoroughfares and ION, pedestrian mobility, key. Um, Pedestrian movement is, is a key function. Um, and motor vehicles are also important, but don't do anything with the cars that frustrates the pedestrian. Okay. And 20 is plenty. Uh, that's, that's a good speed limit if you want walkability. Now, if you don't want walkability, then make it higher. And you'll separate, and you'll do a different design on the place. Um, now, I, I think I've mentioned this a couple times, but context is the um, reason that most design, street design arguments come about. Um, uh, one person is thinking one context in place and the other is thinking a totally different. Uh, in Colorado, a friend of mine told me he was talking to a highway engineer at the corner of a signalized intersection. And the highway uh, and the new urbanist said, uh, boy, this is terrible. This is highly unwalkable. And the uh, highway engineer said, what? What do you mean? We have, we have the, uh, the crosswalk painted there, standard. And we have the pedestrian lights telling you when to go and when not to. And, and, we, and the little bumps that tell the people that are uh, uh, hard of sight that they're at the edge of the road. It's all according to oil there. And the new urbanist knew that, that they were going 45 miles an hour when the light turns green. And somebody's gonna make a mistake. And that's when the crashes and the accidents happen, is when somebody makes a mistake. So, um, so there, they, were, they had two different visions in the, in, uh, about what the place was supposed to be like. And their design thinking is absolutely tied directly to that. Um, and the agency engineers love that level of service. Um, just, it's, they've been trained to do that, and, and just, you can't get them away from it unless you, you spend a lot of time um, in sessions like this. And, uh, uh, and, and we, we, we have developed a walkability index that's a counter to level of service. And it measures 10, <laughs> I like 10, measures 10 features on a street that gives you a grade. We've measured downtown Savannah, we got a grade of 94. We, we measured US 41 north of Sarasota, Florida, we got a 27. Um, so it's, it's very effective at, at telling you um, how walkable the place is. <clears throat> okay, the transect. I've said before we're very poor at def defining place. 
Uh, so let me, let me move uh, ahead with that. It's, it's, it's a lot more complex to think about walking again, like 1900, 1905. It's, it's more complex to think about that. The automobile situation is just a simple one mode and high speed um, situation. But the, the, uh, the function of the streets are divide, di divided into arterial, collector, and local. Um, my wife has a, a problem with this first one because it's an adjective, like arterial sclerosis or something, you know. Or, I mean, it's, it's not a noun, but it's become a noun. Oh, well, I'll meet you out on the arterial. Uh, anyway. Um, There's a transect that biologists have been using. Uh, many of you are uh, familiar with the transect concept? Okay. Um, the biologists use it to define places. Um, you're either in the ocean or you're on the, on the beach or the primary dune or you're back here on the back dune. And, and they generally draw a line on a map and they go and investigate that line and write down what they find. And so things change as they go down that line. We have developed, uh, actually Andre Stawani first came up with this, a transect for the built environment, where the people are. It's our environment. Um, and it goes from the most rural area um, to the most urban place right here. And um, so it goes rural and then suburban and general urban and urban center and then urban core. So we've sliced it uh, five or six different ways to um, to define this. Now, this has been out about 10 years, maybe 15. <clears throat> so now when, when experienced urban designers are talking to each other, you can say, well, how do you see this street turning out? Because it's still on the, on the drawing boards. They say, well, this is going to be about a T4. Uh, it's going to be a T4, T5 street. And then our, in the whole room, everybody that understands this knows, and you can move on, and you can talk uh, much more quickly about what you're designing. Before, um, uh, East Coast and West Coast urban designers couldn't even talk to each other because they didn't have this common terminology. I want to point out something really important right here. Um, think of the distance between the center of this street to the edge of the drawing. And by the way, this does have kind of a profile view, a, a side view of what the place looks like at the very top, very intelligently put together. And this is the, the plan view from looking down from but look at the distance between the center of that intersection to the edge. And let's count the number of houses that you see as you make that walk. If you're in a, in a, in a rural area, you may see one house when you walk from that distance. But if you get into a suburban zone, you see, well, on, and let's just count one side. For, you see one, two, three houses in that same distance. Now you get into the general urban, the walkable place. This is what ION is, that's a T4. Um, you see one, two, three, four, five. So you've jumped from just three to five in that same distance. By the time you get into the urban center, it's, uh, this may be an apartment building. Let's say it's four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. So the number of dwelling units that you can walk by in a given distance is an absolute measure of how efficient your town is put together. That's why it's important to, to have side yards that are rather small. And some people come in and they, they say, ooh, I can't be in a place that's this tight. And you say, well, you don't want to walk, do you? Um, you don't want to walk efficiently down to uh, go to a restaurant or something. But it's, it, it's the number of addresses you walk by in a given quarter mile or a half mile that, that is, a, is a straight up indicator of how uh, important uh, the walkability is to that community. And, and it's um, one, another key measure is if the, um, if the dwelling unit uh, faces the road with its long dimension toward the street, then you're in a drive only place. But as soon as you have the narrower dimension of the dwelling unit facing the street, you've got it. Now, downtown Charleston with the side yards is a perfect example of that. Um, 
So count the number of uh, houses you go by and, and uh, that'll be a great indicator for you. Now, uh, that transect we found was, was good, very good, but not sufficient. It was necessary, but not sufficient to help us plan places. So we invented three levels. We have regional sectors, community units, and transect zones. And these sound a little geeky because an attorney put it together so it would work in a zoning code. They, they had to be clear enough and not ambiguous. Um, you can't just say town center, you know. You, you have to be, have a unique name for each of these places. So we have regional sectors, and that's, um, there's a G1, G2, all the way through G4. Uh, this is where you want the restricted growth, control growth, intended, and an infill. Has four different characteristics of a place you and the planning commission wants to see grow, you know, or not grow. Uh, this would be environmentally dangerous land, perhaps. Um, and then the second one, the community units are down here. And that's a cluster development, that's a traditional neighborhood development, and this is a regional commercial a district, um, and, 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 so, and that is too. So those names of the, of the circles um, give that a, a unique definition that we can all understand and work with. Um, <clears throat> it's, there's a great deal of debate on whether the street, the main street going through, should go through the middle of your community unit or go by the side of it where you cluster four of them together. The people that are in urban design that don't feel like we can ever conquer the road are of this philosophy. Let's do your community off center and not let the street go through the middle. I'm, I'm still for conquering the road and, and you know, getting it right through the middle because uh, when you have cars going through and people walking and biking, those are customers. Those are customers. How many small old downtowns have you seen die when the bypass got built? And they just dry up, you know, they wither. Uh, it, it's just a bad economic decision to uh, bypass or ignore the fact that people in those cars are customers. Uh, and then finally, uh, you get around to the, um, to the transect zones and T1 through T6 that I described earlier uh, this is a table that, um, let's try this again, this is kind of fun. Um, these say that, that, um, that within uh, a, a regional uh, commercial uh, development, then 10 to 30% of your land area should be T4 level of intensity. And then 10 to 30 can be T5, and 40 to 80% has to, can be T6. So that's a pretty big deal development, and, and you see as you go back up the, uh, the scale, the percentages, uh, here a T5 is only 10, 10 to 30%, and a T and D that is within uh, that kind of control growth uh, sector. So we really need to keep refining those definitions of, of what kind of uh, scale and, and structure you have in the community, both the buildings and the streets, before we can communicate with each other. Um, the three-tier transect was done in Fayetteville, Arkansas, and, and uh, this is one type of, of community unit. Here's another, and here's another. And so the map has to be done uh, in a unique way that everyone can see uh, what each one of those unit types are. And the transect, kind of get a little more experience on this. This was, I believe, in Spain. Um, they, they, they had the transect, and, and uh, there's the, uh, there's the special district, I forgot to mention that, a unique place. But this is the general uh, T6, and this is a T5, and it trickles off to T1, which is a natural zone. Again, there's one in Stockholm. Um, <clears throat> this, um, I've been to Stockholm about three or four times, and I really am crazy about the city. This happens to be the 200-year-old downtown. And so you'd have to, I mean, Vince, you need to go over there and, and build a new development that's that tight, which you like to do, right? Um, because Gamlestan is, is very historic, and they're not, to my knowledge, building any new Gamlestan scale developments, but they need to. 
They need to understand this because Gammelstein is one of the most walkable places in all of Europe because of its old scale. Um, let's see. Complete streets, you've probably heard of that. Um, so we're getting into the reaction now to the rest of the, the nation and the, and the de development um, uh, trends and, and characteristics because um, we don't like to admit it, but, but T and Ds and walkable communities like this only occupy less than 5% of the built environment in the United States. That, and, and the urban built environment, not the rural. I'm talking about places with buildings on it. it they still have 95% that's suburban. And, and so we're, <laughs> we got a long way to go. Uh, but this survey says 66, two thirds of the Americans want more transportation options. Well, how are you gonna get that? You're going to make the buildings closer together. You're going to slow the cars down. Um, and look at that. So they have the freedom ah, to choose how they get uh, where they want to go. 70% feel like they have no choice but to drive. So they're stuck with the automobile. And you know, half would like to spend less time in the car. So those are the complete streets movement is about getting more modes active and going. The problem is we're trying to push that group into um, an understanding that, hey, the buildings on the outside of the right-of-way make a lot of difference. You can say, I want to have four modes of travel on this street, and you line it with drive-through drive banks and burger places, it's just not going to happen. We all know that, because there's not enough diversity, and the, and the scale is wrong, and, and the land use is not, uh, not suited for walking. So let's go back to the arterials, collectors, and locals. Um, this is a document, a t <laughs> I'm not kidding you, this is a Federal Highway Administration document that discusses how they are feeling now about context. In other words, they're in the cloud, they have no idea <laughs> what they're going to say about this because this is brand new to them. So they say, well, it's this cloudy thing, you know, we got excess and mobility somewhere in there, there are molecules or whatever, and livability. But it's, it's, it's mystery to them. They really don't understand yet. Uh, they're coming around, but they really don't understand. So here's how I would augment the functional classification. I've done it in three cities already, and I'm looking for opportunities to change it again. We have arterial collector and local, the big streets and the local streets and the ones in between. And in the, the rural area, they're, they're kind of separated in their network scale. When you get into the next suburban level, the streets all get closer to each other, and so your grid is more fine, uh, and the character gets closer to each other also. And here's, this is all we have today. And what I'm saying is we need to add the next group, and that is compact urban. So we need to measure, like, like the new urbanists have already done, measure Charleston, measure Savannah, Key West, Alexandria, and you know, a dozen more you could name, uh, and, and then say compact urban is a valid form, not to bring in as a grandfather clause, well, oh, that's been there since uh, 1705 or, or 1820, so we're gonna grandfather that like downtown Tallahassee, and we'll let them do that, but to, to go out on Farmer John's Dairy and he, he and the family want to get out of dairy farming, and you do a new compact urban place <clears throat> right out there in that rural location. That's what we need to do, and this, this describes that. If you have, in the rural area, just one arterial going through, then you have 55 is your speed going all the way through, right? High speed, green. Um, it, once you get into the suburbs, though, you need to temper that down to about 45, and that's what the speed limits are that you can see. That's reflected. And then the compact urban, there's the old grandfathered compact downtown, you know. And here's what I'm saying we need. We need a new compact urban place that's implementable based on the vision that a community has like this one. We need to be able to replicate this new compact urban place, even in a place that's, that's away from the historic center. These are centers in Cincinnati. Uh, that we worked on, uh, and these are named urban center, urban neighborhood, and <coughs> traditional neighborhood, and, and the, the goal is a half mile um, um, 
compact walkable ring around those towns. And so we were after uh, zoning and transportation laws in Cincinnati that would allow these to be established and therefore justified for walkable street design. And this is a typical street we use in 8, 10, 10, 8. Uh, we, should, we should get those down to 9. Um, Florida DOT, uh, two of my ex-employees are now working at Florida DOT. And the two of them have gotten the standard lane width for Florida DOT reduced from 12 to 11. 12 to 11. 12 is what you have out on the interstate. You don't need 12 in town. So that's, that's the new standard for Florida. And so when you get 11 as the standard, then you can kind of push for 10 once the, the context says that you should. Um, and some people are still fighting this. You know, this is a, uh, some Ford down, down in Florida, and I saw the, the Michigan license plate, and they said, make the choice, go suburban. A um, couple of really quick things that, that we're doing now that relate to this, and then I'll uh, open it for Q&A. This is in New Orleans. There's a convention center that is um, right down next to the Mississippi River. Uh, this is the Long Convention Center. This is the French Quarter, uh, and this is what they call the Warehouse District, if any of you have been there. Um, and this is a half-mile walking circle uh, for the people that are at the convention center. So we're proposing that we take a four-lane street in front of that convention center, that's on the left, and reduce it down to two lanes instead of four. So there'd be greater walkability in front. And we've got other ways to handle the vehicles that, um, that would uh, uh, still need to get in and out. Okay. So this is today, and this is the proposal, just to get the, the walkability to be much greater. Now, one we have not started yet is up in Mississippi, and um, Mississippi is getting progressive, getting progressive. Um, and we call it the Grand Boulevard because the Bully Bulldog is their school mascot at, at Mississippi State University. And, um, and here's th this red road is kind of a ring road that comes and separates to a high degree their university out here from their town down here. And if you've ever heard of the Cotton District, it's a famous walkable community uh, done in, in Starkville. And that's right in here because this was a cotton mill and that's where all the people lived that worked in the cotton mill. They didn't need cars in 18 whatever. They just walked to the cotton mill. So the, the block size is really small. But this barrier exists. Um, these are like freeway interchanges. And, but the problem with that is there's a traffic signal right here and there's a traffic signal down here. So you can get up a great head of steam right through here, and then you just pull over and you got to stop again. So we recognize that as a pretty useless piece of uh, arterial. And so we propose to take that and, uh, and flatten it, just flatten it, take, take actual earth-moving material and remove the grade for this grade separation, take those hills down, and instead of looking like this bushy suburban arterial, uh, go ahead and put some uh, buildings right there and have a walkable park space in between the main lanes and the parking. And that's called a multi-way boulevard. And we, we tried a number of years ago to influence the people in your town to do a multi-way boulevard for Johnny Dodds. And we were not successful, but we tried. Um, and this is the section, you know, 10 foot lanes in the middle. And um, this, this is the, where the right of way is for that. 170 feet, 200 feet. So we're going to put down a design for a multiway right through here, and um, and that's those are the dimensions of what the multiway would be like. And so hopefully that would then once you build the uh, multiway through there, this is likely the kind of land pattern that would be stimulated by a, a, a street that goes by that you can access by walking, biking, transit, and parking on the outside of these lanes. So that's what we hope to do in Starkville, Mississippi. Oh yeah, this is the one that Steve Price, who always puts himself um, like, um, who was? Hitchcock. Hitchcock. He puts himself like Hitchcock into his own drawings. Um, and this is the, the, the Johnny Dodd's final, uh, final episode. Um, there are manuals that are now helping us. New York City started an early manual. 
uh, on, on, uh, on walkability and uh, greater diversity. There's the Urban Street Design Guide um, that's, that's been very helpful. The National Association of City Transportation Officials, notice city instead of rural, okay? Ashto is, is mostly rural, they deal with the states. I found one in India, Better Streets and, and Better Cities, a guide to street design in urban India. And this even looks like a little mattress uh, pattern, you know, with the Indian colors in there. Um, but they, uh, even the bus turning the corner is explicitly drawn um, so you can get, and, I, and these are the million motorcycles that they have. So beautifully done. This was the old 1990 Green Book, uh, the Bible for doing walkable, uh, excuse me, drivable suburban. Uh, we call it kind of the uh, problem with geometric design of highways and streets. And it's gotten a little better. See, they, they tried to get away from the rural uh, look with a bunch of pictures of cities. Problem is, when you get to chapter one, it's still the rural stuff. And uh, so we're moving uh, along with them. This is one you should know about. Manual on uniform traffic control devices. All the signals, all the stripes, all the signs are covered in this one book. <clears throat> and right now, guess how many area types they have in that book? Two, rural and urban. Rural and suburban is what it really is. So this, is, this one would be affected if we went rural, uh, suburban, and compact urban. The compact urban would, have, would never have a sign this large in a compact urban flat. You don't see that kind of sign in downtown uh, Ion. That book needs to be changed. Oh, one quick thing. Um, when you interface with people in the government or talk to the, uh, the engineers, never say traffic light. And, and absolutely never say stoplight. It's a traffic signal. If you walk in and say, you know, we're considering th that you may want to um, uh, install a traffic signal down at Elm and 13, you know, then they might listen to you. But if you walk in and say, we need another uh, a stoplight down there, they're going to say, who is this person? So get some of that language to going with them and, um, and, and use traffic signal. The, the, the traffic light is the thing that goes up and shines light down on the street. That's the light. And the signal is, signal is the one that changes colors. Okay? The, this is a Florida green book. Um, that, that has a chapter in it called TND, down at the end. Way down here, can you read that? Traditional Neighborhood Development. So we slipped that in there, Billy Hathaway and myself, uh, into this uh, standard design uh, for uh, streets and highways. There's a nice small curb in Charleston. Um, this is an important thing, you, if you can park here, and you can turn a truck by there and still have a small radius for the curb and a large radius for the turn. So these are some of the details. Okay. Back to Winter Park. So those are the things that, um, that are in that manual. There's a great delegation. There are automobile, uh, automated automobiles. Um, I think they're okay for freeway operation. I'm not sure about mixed mode on urban streets. Um, there's Robert Davis last week held a conference on, on these auto, auto automobiles and how it would affect 30A and, and Seaside. Uh, people assembled from all over the world for this conference. We saw an electric bus that would go up and down 30A. Uh, we saw a, a Tesla that's being uh, recharged by an electric cord back there. Um, this is Robert with a bicycle. Uh, that costs three thousand five hundred dollars because it's electric assist. You get a boost when you're walking, riding your bicycle. Uh, and we even looked at some drones um, on display. So uh, these are some uh, very important books. I mentioned fighting traffic, um, <coughs> option of urbanism, street design by Victor Dover, and, and Power Broker, which Victor told me to read. He didn't ask me; he told me to read it. And so I'll leave those up as we. Uh, may want to take a couple.